models are important for us to give us a sense of how to understand things that are complex and, and sometimes difficult for us to grasp. For instance, if an architect's building a new skyscraper in a city, the architect will create a model to show people so that they can understand what this new building will be like. But there are models that we have easier access to than architectural models. For instance, many of us or our children have made models from Legos. We've made things like an Eiffel Tower or the Starship Enterprise or, or any of many different kinds of models through Legos. And those Lego models help to convey to us what something is like. If we make a Lego model of the Eiffel Tower, for instance, we get a better sense of the curvature of the tower and, and what the tower is like but we don't confuse the model for the Eiffel Tower. We know that it's a model. In the 1990s, I had the opportunity to work at the University of Miami School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry on a special internship program that used a biopsychosocial spiritual model. And that model was used to train an interdisciplinary group of residents and interns, psychiatric residents, psychology interns, social work students, nursing students, a whole gamut of people. My role was as the spirituality guy, the spirituality preceptor. And I was charged with the task of training all of these different interns, these residents, on spirituality and the role spirituality plays in uh, mental health services, both inpatient and outpatient. It challenged me to really think very concretely about spirituality. And out of that experience, I developed a model, a model for understanding the role spirituality plays with the rest of life. A number of years later, I wrote a book about that model. It's called The Integrated Self, A Holistic Approach to Spirituality and Mental Health Practice. In this book, I really talk about different dimensions of what make us the people we are and how spirituality interrelates with that. It presents a model, a way of depicting this interaction of these various facets of ourself. I built the model around four different dimensions. They're large dimensions that include many components. But just to summarize this, to give you an idea, I want to talk about those four dimensions. And as I do that, be sure to subscribe to this channel and click the bell. The foundational dimension that I talk about is historical cultural. You know, we're all born in a certain time in history and into a certain culture. Because of when we're born and the culture we're born into, there are things that become part of us, that become a natural aspect of who we are. I was born in the 1950s and, and went through the turmoil of the 60s and 70s. And it isn't just that I'm a certain number of years old, but it's that those experiences have shaped the person that I am. We often talk about some of this on a less reflective level. For instance, we talk about the differences between uh, millennials and, and baby boomers or, or Generation Z and Generation X. And we know that there are some generational differences, but those differences are, are really much deeper because the way our time and history and our culture shape us, orient us to be certain kinds of people with certain kinds of values and ways of understanding the world around us. Within our history and culture, we're born into bodies. It isn't just that we have bodies as some appendage to us, but that we are our bodies. Our bodies mediate all the world around us and, and all of our experiences. And when people see us, when they see our bodies, our smile, the way we look, the way we walk, the way we laugh, they know it's us. Our bodies convey to people who we are. So everything about us is embodied. It's an embodied dimension of our life. As our bodies grow and change, our experience changes. We grow in vitality through youth into adulthood, and then we sort of 
take another curve and begin to lose some of that uh, energized piece of us that we had when we were younger. All of that is about how our bodies help us understand who we are, and they make us the people we are. In our history and culture and in our bodies, we engage in the world. I call this the level of engagement. It's our relationship, our, the work we do, our hobbies, our interests, everything that we engage in, as well as what we don't do. Those things are all part of what make us who we are. Uh, you may be a tennis player, or you may be a swimmer. That's part of who you are. Or you may be somebody who just prefers to sit on the couch and watch Netflix and not be too active. That's part of who you are. This identity with engagement is very important in, in most cultures in different ways, particularly in the US and Western cultures. The first questions we ask, ask people are, what do you do? Then we ask about relationship status. Are you married? Are you single? Those things cue us into who a person is. Other cultures may ask who your family is. That's about who you are. That's about your engagement. Within history and culture, within our bodies, within our engagement, there is another dimension, the spiritual dimension, the dimension that mediates in and through the other dimensions that help us to understand and experience and discover and create things that are meaningful and purposeful and valuable. Often our culture, our history, give us a sense of what we should value where meaning in life should be found. So that meaning, that spiritual dimension has a connection with the, our birth and with our culture. We engage in practices or do things in our bodies so that when I sit in meditation, I'm experiencing my body differently. And when I engage, whenever I'm feeling at peace because of my spiritual practice or feeling fulfilled, that shapes how I engage. So all of these pieces fit together. And it's in this constellation of multiple dimensions of who we are that we can talk about spirituality and mental health, our psychological dimension, and understand what it means to be healthy individuals. In the book, The Integrated Self, I talk about these dimensions and I explore some particular aspects that are helpful for clinicians for instance, I talk about how to begin to assess where spirituality is and how it's operative in life. I also look at the dynamic between religiosity and spirituality and how to understand that terminology. And different from many books, many books on spirituality and mental health provide whole different ways of doing therapy and clinical work. I don't go there. I believe that if you're already a licensed clinician, you know how to do therapy. You've been trained in evidence-based practices. Instead, I make suggestions on how to add on to those practices, how to build your, your repertoire further to address spirituality. While the book is really written for master's level clinicians who are busy people and who need very succinct information, uh, I, I do recommend the book for other folks who are interested in the way psychology and spirituality relate to each other. The book will help introduce you to thinking in some different ways and provide some tangible skills. So check out The Integrated Self wherever it is you buy books. It may be a special order at a bookstore or you can buy it online. I want to thank you for your time. Remember to subscribe to this channel, like the video, leave some comments about your perceptions about the integration of spirituality and psychology and mental health. And know that I really appreciate your time today, that you've taken time to be here. Have a great day.